I moved to London five years ago. Before that, I had lived in one place my whole life. A little town with a population smaller than the student body at my high school. When I came out, I was the only trans person the town had ever known. At 13 years old, I felt like I was the only person like me in the whole world. But when I moved here, I found out that I wasn't nearly as alone as I thought I was. Here are just some of the people I've met who showed me that. Uh, my name is Kenzie, uh, I'm 18, uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I identify as non-binary and genderqueer. Um, I'm a ceramic and photo special in real art, and I just like making art about my experiences and the things around me. My name is Nick, uh, I go by he, him, and I'm a trans man. I am an artist living in London. Uh, I've been living here for about 15 years now. Um, originally, I'm from Russia. Uh, so coming here after living there was kind of a, a big culture shock, but I definitely prefer living here just because it is so much more accepting. My name is Ryan Lavoie. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I identify as trans male. Uh, I'm an artist. I love like painting and stuff like that, um, but I definitely want to go into like animation and such. Uh, maybe voice acting, because I really like that. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. My name is Monica Joy. My pronouns are they, them, and I identify as non-binary, gender non-conforming. I'm an artist uh, studying at the O. I specialize in ceramics and photography and lithography, but I don't know where I'm going with that at all. I'm pretty lost as an artist. I'm also a model in a pretty bad industry because that's, yeah, that's how modeling functions. My name is Max. Uh, I identify as a non-binary trans guy, um, and my pronouns are he, him, and they, them. I'm a 21-year-old university dropout. Uh, I was taken bioarchaeology, and then I took a break, and now I don't know if I'll go back. Um, I do photography in my spare time. I'm trying to get back into creative writing, uh, and I work night shift at Tim Hortons. <laughs> Daniel Mitchell Benoit, just Dan usually is what friends call me. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and my gender identity is generic binary trans man. <laughs> right now I'm studying at Fanshawe College. I was my second year in radio broadcasting. I do announcing, I do programming, I do promotions. Um, I'm hoping to work in the industry after. I also would really love to get to, to things like advocacy. I care a lot about being, because I'm very, very privileged in, in the way I've been able to live my life and be trans publicly. I have a very loving, accepting family. My, the, when I came out, I came out in high school, but I lived out in college. Um, so everyone in my college program has been nothing but very nice and respecting to me. So I'm, I'm super lucky and I want to be able to use that luck. I don't know how to start that, but I am hoping I can somehow. So wherever I end up moving once I, I graduate this year, I want to start something there. I'm rude. They, them, non-binary, lesbian. I don't really see myself as mask or femme or fluid. I'm just like, gender is an illusion and here I am. Every character I make kind of has a little bit of me in them. It's, it'd almost be impossible to not have that if I made them all myself. And I like tea a lot. My name is Jax. I identify as a trans male and I use he, him pronouns. I'm a Jax, I'm a BLR student. I do this. I'm Jax, I'm a brother and child. <laughs> I am a child. Shockingly, I do have parents that exist. My name is Ellie. Um, I use they, them pronouns or whatever other pronouns I would. I don't really care. Um, and I don't really also care about labels, so I don't really have I don't know. I like to animate. That's about all I'm into right now. I like making characters and I like to listen to music and sit around and do nothing. I have no job. <laughs> um, the way that I like to describe trans really to like people 
people who don't really know, and I, 2019 people don't know what trans is, do they exist? I don't know. But if people don't know, really, my, my go-to definition is just somebody whose gender is diverged away from the one that they were assigned up with, and that's kind of how I connect to the term. Um, I guess I would define the term transgender as being uh, someone who doesn't identify as the um, sex they were assigned at birth. For me, I tend to look at it from a very scientific point of view, um, being the biology student that I am, and look at it as a transition from one thing to another. So whether that be from one gender to another, from one gender to no gender, uh, that's kind of the way I define it. For me, it's like my it's part of my identity. It's just not identifying as a girl or feminine. Um, I think it can mean something different for everyone and in relation to their own experience on this world. In this world. Yeah. For me, um, being non binary is like, it's an identity outside of the binary. I don't feel like a woman or like a man. I just feel like Kenzie. I'm just, yeah, so I don't. It's a really neutral identity for me, especially, and that's why I say non-binary and genderqueer, because I, that's literally genderqueer kind of embodies that, like, for me, just being Kenzie. So, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it means to me, just neutral. Yeah. It just kind of means, like, I just exist here in this void without a gender. What's up? Um, at this point, I've given up caring, so <laughs> there's not really any more definition anymore. There used to be, but yeah, I don't really have one. I guess it's more of a personal thing. Whatever someone else defines as their transgender or like non binary or whatever experience is like, I'll be like, yeah, cool, that's what I'll use for you. But it's very individual. You know, like thinking back into the past, like I never really thought before that there were ever signs in my childhood because I came out at like 19. <laughs> um, but like looking back on it now, I can like see things where I'm like, that should have been a sign, that should have been a sign, that should have been. So it's just kind of like a cool like reflection. It's ne it never like growing up was a huge deal to me. Like gender in general was never like a crazy deal. Like. Even my parents never forced one thing or the other on me, and so I was always just kind of like, whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think it's when I moved to Ontario. Uh, I'm from Newfoundland, but I grew up in Newfoundland. Um, when I moved here, it turned out to be like a big deal. A lot more people were very like, there were so many different opinions that clashed, and it kind of was like, whoa, whoa. Like, even in school, I moved in sixth grade, and it turned out to be like all the girls hang out and all the guys hang out, and I was like, "Huh? That never happened to me before." So I was kind of like, "That's weird." Um, I had to kind of choose what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be all the time. It was very stressful. I know for like thinking on it now, I look at situations when I was a kid where I used to dress up like super masculine, like I would go to like siblings' birthday parties and try to look like a boy so that like nobody else who didn't know me already would know I was a girl. And I had that, like, I didn't even think about that as being weird when I was a kid. It was just something I would do every now and again. Um, I think after realizing that like heterosexual and cisgender was not the only option in the world, I was kind of like, hey, I think I like girls. And I had a gigantic crush on one of my friends. And I was kind of like, I don't even know if I ever really had a crush on boys before. I was just kind of like, I should have a crush on boys because everybody else in my class has a crush on boys. And this boy is my friend, so I guess I have a crush on that boy. But then I was like, oh, that's not at all what this is like. That's not at all how that works. So I guess I realized that I was not heterosexual first. Um, and then I was like looking more into like pop culture and stuff. And I discovered, like, people, like, real people who weren't anime characters, who were, like, not cisgendered. 
I know my school had a better health class than a lot of other schools out there, but they didn't teach us anything about trans and non-binary people. I didn't even know that transgender was a thing until I was like 16 and I joined the GSA at my school and they were talking about people who were trans and I was like, what's that mean? You mean like transsexual? And they're like, no, no, listen. And I was like, oh, you can do that? And they were like, yes. And I was like, huh. I was lucky enough to like feel like I'm in a safe enough space to when I wanted to explore um, my gender expression of like what kind of clothes I wear and like cutting my hair short and styling it differently, I, I'm able to do that. So that was basically where I started was I like, I remember when I was in about grade nine or 10, I like tied my hair in a ponytail and I was like just like really looking at my cheekbones and trying to look as masculine as I could and I thought, whoa, that's kind of cool. Like I can look masculine. Um, and then shortly after I cut my hair short, and got like just started shopping a lot more in the men's section. Um, years after that, I've been like just combining masculine clothes and feminine clothes, and not really regarding it as either, and just picking what I like. Uh, the first introduction I had to being trans was actually uh, when I was in grade 8 and my friend came out as trans. I had never had experience with um, the LGBT community before then. <laughs> so, yeah. It was... I, I don't really remember it being a surprise to me. It kind of... I always registered my friend as being... Um, very well. He, he was very masculine to me, and I like I just always register him as being a guy. Um, so for me, it wasn't like a huge surprise, but it was definitely like an eye-opening thing for me because immediately I started to kind of like question myself. <laughs> I guess in the whole uh, trans conversation, I kind of realized when I was 15 that I wasn't female, was the, kind of the only idea I had in my head at the time. Um, it was a lot of kind of internet waves, I guess. I saw a lot of trans people in online circles I was in, and, and they made me kind of think, hey, that sounds a little more comforting and a little better than uh, what people are calling me now. So I, I thought I was non-binary for about three years, and I was using they, them pronouns, and went by Arden for a long time. Um, and then. I don't know what turned, I think a friend of mine started using he, him pronouns and for some reason that one person kind of triggered that, that thought that, hey, again, like before, that sounds a lot better than what I'm being called now, so I tried it and I stuck with the name Dan because it was a nickname some of my friends were using at the time and it's been that way ever since. For a lot of my high school life, a lot of my friends kind of joked around like, are you sure you're not a trans boy, are you sure you're not a boy, and I was like, no, I'm happy with what I am right now, but I wasn't, but I also knew that I wasn't exactly a boy. And then I learned that non-binary people are a thing, and I was like, that's it. That's the one I am. That's me. There's this one song by a band, I can't remember, it's called Garbage or Garage. <laughs> but it's called Androgyny. And I listened to that a lot, and I was like, hey, that's kind of how I feel. So for a while I was like, maybe I just want to be androgynous. Maybe I'm fine with that. And I kind of like approached my mom about that and she was just like yeah whatever if that makes you happy then you do that and but it was really I was really quiet about it and I didn't want to like tell anybody because I thought it would be weird okay so I would say probably I think it was closer to the end of grade 11 was when I kind of started realizing that I wasn't cis um, um, and then yeah I guess over the last uh, like end of grade 11 would have been like a year and a half two years ago now I guess um, I just kind of started realizing that I f felt more like masculine than feminine sometimes, or like especially being neutral. That's like, it began a lot more as feeling one or the other, and then I think now over time, I kind of started growing on to more like feeling just being neutral and just being Kenzie. But yeah, I, I would say that I just started kind of experimenting with like binding my chest and um, wearing more masculine clothing, like that's when I know I can I can look back on my Instagram and find pictures of me and there's a difference between in grade like the rest of grade 11 towards that time when I started like yeah wearing more masculine clothing I would say and then kind of just like switching it up so yeah like with the sculpture 
it kind of was just me trying to figure out a way of talking about that without just like outright talking about it so yeah it was kind of just like taking like for me it was just looking at symbols and stuff and kind of like breaking down how I related to all that and then kind of like putting it together so essentially like, that's why I ended up doing like both the male and female symbol and then the purple in the middle because that was like my way of signifying that I feel not like neither one nor the other. Um, my experience with figuring out who I was and who I am uh, was long. It took me a while to figure out uh, how I identified. At first I was like, oh no, I'm not binary. And then I was like, no, I'm gender fluid. And I kind of went, but maybe I'm trans. And there was a lot of uh, moments where I, uh, my friends and I talked about, like, I had a lot of like internalized transphobia because I just didn't want to like accept that I was trans. And when I first tried to come out to my parents, um, I didn't word it correctly and ended up just saying, you know what, never mind. I was just like overthinking things. And I took two more years on top of that to actually like accept like who I am. And so yeah, it was a journey and I'm glad that I'm here now as who I am. <laughs> it's hard because it, I used to, I used to be like, uh, about it and very like, I'd tense up and be like, uh, please don't call me that. Um, but I don't really care much anymore. I do get a lot of like she, her pronouns and I'm still like, that's fine, sure, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I feel like gender is so personal now that I don't think what other people think of me really reflects what I feel about myself, so. I do identify as a gay man right now. Just, uh, it was kind of a strange process for me, you know, I've traversed the LGBT aspect of being part of the queer community. And I think back on that, uh, it always just strikes me as funny that I went in a span of two years from identifying as a lesbian and being a very, very femme person to literally the polar opposite in terms of like stereotypical identification. The first introduction to the concept of being trans or not binary for me was uh, my best friend actually uh, in elementary school. Uh, he was a year older than me and he came out to me uh, when I was in the ninth grade. And after that, you know, it definitely kind of got the wheels turning in my brain, thinking about, you know, how I felt about my own gender identity. Um, actually, a few years after he came out to me, I ended up coming out as non-binary. Later on, I ended up figuring out that that wasn't exactly right for me. Um, I identified more as a trans man. But yeah, that was definitely like, the first exposure I had to the trans community outside of, you know, seeing caricatures of trans people in TV. have like a vague memory of seeing it in a Brazilian novella of seeing like a, I don't know if it was a drag queen or a trans woman as a comedic character and I was like, this is like sad, like why, why do people think this is funny? Because like it was just a person introduced as a comedy factor, not as a like genuine character, just someone to be laughed at. I haven't found like a good trans narrative that doesn't revolve around like violence or dying or like it's just general sadness. <laughs> I think that it's it's like really a cross because there's a lot of ways where trans and non-binary people are represented very well and then there's a lot of instances where they aren't and it really just depends like there's a lot of queer media that is properly and accurately representing like um, just like non-binary trans lives, or um, even some, I don't know, some like TV series and movies for, like are now becoming like, I can watch them and think, whoa, like that's really accurate to my own experience or to others, and it isn't like harmful the way they're portraying it. But I think that there is a lot of, like the majority of media portrays it in a way that just miscommunicates what like, what trans people want to represent about themselves and creates a different idea or a different stereotype. There's a lot of people who will refuse to hire trans actors and because they want a big name they'll just get cis people to play trans people which 
I don't know, I've made the argument before, especially with that movie that Scarlett Johansson was going to be in. I don't remember who it was about, but um, she was going to play a trans man. And um, I was talking to some people in my course about it, and they were all like, but she's acting, she's acting. And it's like, sure, but you have to understand that this is a case of, you know, this is a very vulnerable, underrepresented group. This is such a good chance to get someone who really knows what the role is and really knows what this calls for. Um, so I think one of the biggest things is if you are going to have a trans character, if anyone's planning to in any media they're making, just hire someone who's trans to play them. Hire trans actors! Like, they're out there. And we know they're out there, so fucking hire them! Because that's the way, like, that's the best way you're going to get authentic stories, is if you include trans creators in your creative piece. In terms of just, like, having those characters in the show in the first place, I think there definitely needs to be, like, obviously just generally more. It needs to be more that are taken seriously and more where I almost want to say more where it's not their whole storyline because being trans is important but there are a lot of trans people who don't want to make it a big deal and don't even want to draw attention to it in their daily lives and I think that that's important to honor because that's how they want to live and I think everybody kind of needs a trans person in media that shows that that's how they want to live someone who it is a big deal and it is their whole life and someone where it doesn't matter at all I definitely have a lot of non-binary characters because, like you asked me before, I don't see a lot of them in media, or maybe I'm just watching the wrong shows, but a lot of my comics are born from the thought of, the show didn't do that right, I'm going to make a comic that does. I really started taking writing and developing characters and stuff more seriously during the time when I started, you know, feeling, started socially openly like being open with my parents about like being trans or like being <coughs> uh, like queer generally um, and that kind of really snowballed a lot of my characters do have some sort of queerness to them which is really fun I think everyone's voice is important and all of my characters are very like just mundane people so they're just like someone you'd find on the street you know I think one of my main characters is just like a really shitty punk guy, but his best friend is like a trans guy. You know, those are two truths that are s happening somewhere, and I think those voices should totally be heard, even if it's just by me and a few people. <laughs> Non-binary doesn't feel existent in the modeling industry because it is like historically so reliant on men's fashion and women's fashion. And from a logistical point, I don't mind this because it is like, there's men's fashion week, there's women's fashion week, and then like combining them is a whole new thing. And when they are combined, and androgyny is introduced into fashion, it is all about the fact that it's androgynous. It can't just be, now it is this. Like, it has to, it's usually like centered on the fact that, whoa, it's androgyny, and it comes across as like, in a harmful way, it comes across as it's just in fashion to be gender neutral, which is not, like not beneficial to anyone really, other than that it's like, being introduced in a way that it's like cool so it's at least there's that that's progressive but um when i'm like i don't yeah i don't think it's good that there is such a distinct like male or female in fashion i wish that it could be more blurred those lines it was called luna it was about this girl whose sibling can't remember i think it was i think they were male to female, oh, yeah, they were male to female, and they were becoming Luna. And it was about the, the sister dealing with that. And it was the most, like, agonizing thing, because this girl is just like, oh my god, I'm so tragic because people are making fun of me because, because my sister is trans, and I'm just so sad about that. And it was like, it wasn't at all like about, hey, this is how you should actually deal with this, or this is how you should actually, like, behave if you are having, like, you're, like, unsure how to act. It was just this, like, one girl bitching and moaning for the entire book because she's so, she's like, oh my god, what do I do? My, my brother is my sister, and I don't know what to do with that anymore, because, like, I'm 15, and I have no issues in my life, so I'm gonna complain about this, and it really pissed me off. It was like being trans is a curse for people around you, and I was like, that's not helping at all. I know that not all books can be like, being trans is great and everybody is great because then people are going to be like, oh, why are you complaining? It's easy. 
but like it was just so dumb. The author of that book, I don't know, actually pay attention to real trans people's stories and try to like consider how you might make people feel by portraying them in this light, by portraying them as like a burden to their family. Like, yeah, we already know that it's hard on our family sometimes. Like, even if your family's really supportive, you feel guilty still. A big challenge that I've had just um, kind of accepting, you know, like not everyone is gonna be okay with like who I am and that's fine, but like accepting the fact that there are people who are going to go out of their way, way to make your life miserable just because they're afraid and they don't want to try and understand. I do live a very privileged life, so I don't think I face many. Um, considering that I'm not, that I'm androgynous and like cis passing, um, there aren't many instances where someone is outwardly oppressing me. I receive a lot of harassment online, but I don't let that affect me very much. And in person, it's usually just like if I out myself to someone, they will reject that identity, like they won't agree and they won't refuse to refer to me properly. But I don't, like physically that doesn't harm me very much, mentally just a little bit, but it's not, it's definitely not on the level that a lot of trans people experience where they're in physical danger. And I guess there's obviously fears because I would love to experiment with gender presentation more, but something I'm really worried about is after I graduate I need to get a job and there are people who will not hire me because of that. My legal name isn't changed, so like if I apply to a job and have my like Daniel on my resume, if I have to put down my legal name on forms, like they could decide that they don't want to hire me anymore. The biggest challenge that I faced is getting over the paranoia that, you know, everybody around you is transphobic and you have to watch out for that all the time. Especially coming from the place in the world that I do, um, it's not safe to come out in Russia ever. Like you will not be accepted. Even families that I've met that are extremely progressive are very wary of trans people and it definitely kind of, it, it, it feeds that paranoia a lot and it makes it a very hard thing. Even coming out to my very progressive mother was very hard for me. Just admitting that I had finally figured things out and I wasn't happy when I came out initially. It was very freeing for me after I was out, but coming out for me was... It was very scary, like the scariest thing I've ever done in my life, more so than coming out as gay or coming out as a lesbian. It was, yeah, honestly, like the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. I've spoken to like a few people who are pretty uneducated about trans people and like I would refer to my friend who is a trans man and they were like, oh, he's a woman and like not not comprehending it. and. I would, I usually explain it as like, nope, he's a man now, like, fully identifies as male, is hoping to one day physically transition, but that shouldn't matter, but most people that I've had to explain this to just can't comprehend that, like, they're really stuck on the, oh, but it's a girl. It's a little disappointing to have that response. Yeah, I think a lot of it is... Uh, the conception, the misconception that it's a sexual thing, or a kink, and that it's just a bunch of drag queens. That's the other thing. People are like, "Oh, it's a drag queen. It's a trans. It's a trans person." It's like, no, that's that's different. I feel like, especially because I'm not stealth and never was, um, people I don't think take me as seriously sometimes. And that was something I experienced a lot when I was identifying and presenting female too. Is people don't take female anger as seriously was something I noticed a lot and I think that carried over to me being trans because I'm open about it. I'm a man, a man now, but it's, it's whenever I'm upset about something or even, I don't get super angry too often, but whenever I'm angry about something people just kind of brush it off as me being emotional. I think a lot of the time, and I've noticed this even with people who are otherwise very good allies, is especially when they misgender you, um, They'll go into the, the whole, oh, I'm so, so sorry, like, uh, you know, I'm not that kind of person. Like, I know. It was a mistake. It's fine. You corrected yourself. I would prefer the next time you just moved on. Because now you've called attention to the fact that you said the wrong pronoun. And it kind of 
it takes it from you apologizing to me for doing something that I don't like hearing and you kind of turning it around and like, oh, well, you know I'm not that type of person. It's not about you. Not even sort of. Like, and that's kind of something I've noticed even among like the best allies that I've ever met is, you know, they they want to make sure that you know that they're not transphobic. So they assert that over and over and over again. But it comes to the point where you silence other people who are saying like, hey, you did this thing and it bothered me, please don't do that next time. And they turn it into, oh, well, you know, I'm not a bad ally. Like, I never said you were, I just said like, please, please don't do this. Like, you need to listen to people, even outside of the trans community, you need to listen to people when they tell you that something that you did made them upset or uncomfortable and do your best to not do it again. I'm kind of still kind of shocked and experiencing all these new things all the time. I grew up in tiny towns where like trans and gay people and queer people generally just didn't exist. Like I grew up in Newfoundland and that was like, I lived in a town of maybe 30 people and then I moved to Ontario and I lived in a town of maybe 100 people and then now I moved to London and it's a big city and I'm like, whoa, there's so many people happening and there's so many things happening. And I know that there's bigger cities out there where there's a lot more things happening, but as someone who's never experienced that until like very, very recently, there's like a very diverse range of people. When I was in Asia, I, did, I met a single person who identified as non-binary and they were from Canada. So I just thought, whoa, it's like really laid out for me of how much more welcoming we are here to people exploring their gender. And any, like I didn't come out to a single person when I was there as non-binary because even coming out as like bi or pan, like I'm actually pan, but I would come out as bi because if I said pan, nobody knew what that meant. So I'd come out as bi and then people would right away have like an assumption of lesbian standards for me. So it's like, okay, I'm not gonna tell anyone I'm non-binary because they don't even have the slightest idea of what that means and I wasn't down to educate everyone I met. But when I got back, like everyone is just like comfortable referring to me as they. It was very refreshing. Um, I feel like online is definitely stronger. Like I'm a stronger part of it online, just because I can like share more posts or like be connected with other queer people that I like don't see in my personal life. Um, I'm not super connected with it like in person though. Um, the queer community on Western campus is getting bigger but I was never involved in it from first year, so I'm a little bit disconnected from them now, now that I'm not a student either, and it's even worse. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just an online participation. <laughs> mostly it's just like being able to share posts about my queer identities on like my Facebook or Tumblr or my Instagram. Um, and just like, I'm part of like some trans groups on Facebook and I've met people through, through that, which is kind of cool. What I've learned overall about from an experience of gender identity and being all over the map over so long uh, is that it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. In the grand scheme of life, however you feel best about yourself and whatever you're most comfortable with is what you need to do and whatever anyone else says, it shouldn't ever matter. So, you know, I think that just do you. And I know that that's so hard. It's so easy to say and then hard to live by, but once you kind of figure it out and are able to do it, you know, that's all you should have to do. Just live your own truth. It's fun. Ask a lot of questions, do a lot of research, reach out to people around you that you trust, who you think or you know have had experience with that sort of thing before. Uh, it never hurts to get some good advice. Um, I feel like just also based on personal experience, like, I feel like I tell people it's perfectly okay to do that label hop thing. Because um, I felt weird about it for a long time, where I was like, why can't I find something that fits? Like, can I not just stick with something I've already been through? Why is that not enough for me? And I also had a lot of people, not a lot of people, but like some, some people be like, oh, you don't need labels. So I feel like my advice is, it's okay to want one, it's okay to have a journey finding one, and it's okay to finally land on one, and it's okay if that changes in the future. <laughs> and 
this is, I guess, a little cheesy, but I guess just it's okay because it's really easy to fall into the thought that not being, not being who you were born as, or however you want to word it, it's a, it's very easy to fall into the idea that that's something that's wrong and that's something that's bad. It's not only pushed by a, you know, kind of overworking or uh, organized religion and, and even just media tropes that still exist. If it's not a trans character, it's making fun of people who are gender nonconforming. All of those things make it very easy to internalize these thoughts that it's not okay and this is something I need to ignore. Um, it's definitely not worth ignoring because even if you question your gender and it ends up not being anything, it's better that you that you explored that, discovered it wasn't for you. Um, it's better to explore every avenue of your life that you think might make it better and might make living more positive than it is to, to ignore it. Well, I guess my advice would be um, keep, like, if you're questioning, you're going to be questioning your whole life, keep going, you're fine, like, no matter, no matter what happens, like, you're still going to be you at the end of the day, um, and for those who are, like, closeted and afraid of coming out, um, you're valid. <laughs> I was afraid for four years, um, and I was lucky enough to have a good experience in coming out, um, but like some people are not as fortunate you will have your experience and no matter what happens um, it's yours and you'll grow from it and um, it's never going to be like the end of your story either so keep going I think the last question that I have for you is if I use the term 21st century gender revolution, oh, how would you define that? I would say, hell yeah. I would say yes. I would love a 21st century gender revolution. And I would spearhead that as well because I love revolutions. <laughs> I think it needs to happen because well, if we look historically, what makes change in history? Riots and revolutions and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Violent or non-violent. It could be a sneak attack from behind and, you know, with the internet, we could do it that way. Or it could be, you know, riots on the streets. But I do think that it's important that voices are heard, you know. Voices need to be heard in order for more people to be happy. The world sucks right now. And the only thing that we can cling to is ourselves and being happy and being, being general. <laughs> oh, see, that term for me is kind of difficult because I think there's many different ways to have a revolution, whether or not you're thinking, you know, historically with like the French Revolution, I say as a huge history fan, or just like, you know, quiet revolutions in your day-to-day -day life. I think it can be very hard to pinpoint exactly how to define that. I think each and every person would experience that revolution in their own type of way, if that makes sense. 21st century gender revolution. Um, that, I would def mm. Well, on one hand, it sounds like, it kind of sounds like, um, I can't think of the words. What's the um like when? It sounds like um. It sounds like it sounds like a trendy name that you give to something when you want to like gloss over it. Like revolution, I think has lost the like impact of being like the French Revolution because everything now is whoa! It's revolutionary. This movie came out. It's revolutionary. This book came out. It's revolutionary. So being like, it's the 21st century gender revolution sounds like you're just like, yeah, in 2018, we're gonna learn how to drive. Just saying fuck gender in every sense, like fuck gender roles, the societal standards, just do whatever you wanna do, dress how you wanna dress. Gender doesn't fucking matter. It really doesn't matter at all. And in the grand scheme of things, in society standards it does, but I think our generation is kind of realizing that really, what does it actually mean? other than your self-identity.
So I did, I mentioned before that I had never heard this term before. And then I learned that it was used, like pro it was probably invented by like cis hetero individuals. And I think it's strange like to hear it and knowing that context. But if I didn't know that context, I would think that it's like some, like it is the, like re it, a revolution of like the way that we look at gender and the way that we consider it in our lives, relating relating to ourselves, relating to other people. And like, I can think of it in having a positive outlook of like the idea that like when we meet someone, we don't assume their gender at all based on how they physically present themselves and like referring to every person we meet as they until they disclose otherwise. What an ideal world, yeah. I've never heard that, but I like it. <laughs> Um, I feel like I would define that as just, like, from my generation down, people feeling like they have the freedom to explore themselves and decide on what, what they want out of life, who they are. Like, I think it's, there's a lot more experiencing journeying going along that older generations are angry about for some reason, but I, I feel like I would define it as people feeling like they have the freedom to find themselves. I would define that as people just finally being allowed to be who they've always been and who they are supposed to be. Um, because right now, um, there's still room for improvement, but uh, right now people are the luckiest that they've ever been. Um, within reason right right at this moment, but um, they're, they're the luckiest that they've ever been in terms of being able to be who they are. Um, because a hundred years ago, I would not be here as who I am. I would not be allowed to be here as who I am. So um, it's not people be, trying to be special. It's not people trying to be... Um, attention seeking and trying to be um, it's not it's people who are different not trying to be different but trying to be themselves I really like it first off um, what would that mean to me that means finally there's a lot of people who are being happy and not being ashamed about it um, I follow a lot of like uh, trans I guess fashion gurus I guess would be the answer on a uh, on Instagram who dress in these amazing wild ways and present their gender in ways that they don't care about what other people think and that's crazy to me because I care a lot about what other people think so seeing other people adopting that more and being able to just go out there and do what they want and not give a fuck it's awesome and I, I, I would love a 21st century gender revolution let people do what they want with their gender and don't judge them for it It kind of sounds like a punk band <laughs> really into listening to. Trans people have always existed and will always exist. Right now, thanks to the incredible work of trans activists whose revolution began far before the turn of the 21st century, Great strides have been made in trans education, resources, rights, and solidarity. But we still have a long way to go. And I know that there are people out there feeling the same loneliness and desperation that 13-year-old kid in that little town felt watching the sun go down every day, wondering if there was a future out there for them. To those people, I have this to say. You are never alone. There is love out there for you in so many different forms, and you do have a future. I continue to meet extraordinary trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people all the time, and every time that I do, it changes my life for the better. Now at the end of the day, when I see pink, white, and blue as the sun's going down, I think about how happy I am to be alive. And I can't wait to see who I meet tomorrow.